A scripture for our final time together is from the Gospel according to St. Luke, from chapter 18, beginning at verse 1, reading through verse 8. And then he spoke a parable to them that men ought always to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. And now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The Word of God for the people of God. Let's pray. Father, even here in this text, you have told us that we ought always to pray. And so we pray now that we might hear your word, understand your word, be gripped by your word, strengthened by your word, and encouraged by your word. For we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. So often, Jesus used the pedagogical device of the parable to illustrate a, an important point that he was making. And sometimes we assume that the parables, because they are stories, are the easiest portions of the New Testament literature to understand. And yet we are told in the Scriptures themselves that in many respects Jesus used parables to hide the secret things of God from those who did not have eyes to see or ears to hear. And in many respects these parables were enigmatic to those who heard them originally. But there are a few occasions where Jesus himself tells us what the principal point of the parable is. And in this case, we are told that at the beginning of the text that Jesus told this story to explain to people that they ought always to pray and not faint. This is a parable for people who are tired, for people who are weary. This parable is for you, Chuck. You preached twice today. This is my first time today. This is Chuck's fifth sermon. 
today. And we're going to pray that you don't faint. Look at me. <laughs> All right. This is what Jesus speaks to those who endure trials and tribulations, that you must always pray and not faint. And then the meaning of the parable, paraboleo, means to throw something alongside him. Jesus teaches a truth, and then he throws a story next to it in order to enhance its poignancy. Jesus said, there was in a certain town a judge who had no regard for God and no regard for man. He not only cared about, didn't care about heavenly things, the only interests he had in earthly things were his own self-interest. He wasn't even a humanist, had no humanitarian concerns whatsoever, and even though he had been ordained by God to sit in the seat where he was accountable to God for the administration of justice for the people under his authority, he was so corrupt he didn't care at all about justice. And so Jesus paints the, por paints the portrait of this man who is the quintessential political figure of corruption. And then in contrast to this man who has been established in the seat of power and of authority, he talks about this impoverished widow who is utterly helpless in the society of the day without an advocate. And she has been defrauded. She's been a victim of injustice. And so she comes now and pleads her case before this corrupt official and asks that she might be vindicated from her adversary. But the judge had no time for this woman. Get away from me, woman. She had no money that she could enrich him. He didn't want to waste a minute of his time in hearing her case. So she walked away. And then she turned around. And she came back and she knocks on the door. You know, sometimes this parable is called the parable of the unjust judge, but it's also sometimes called the parable of the importunate widow. The woman who refused to give up, she just kept coming back, banging on the door, sir, would you please hear my case? Get away, I told you, I'm not interested in you, I'm not interested in God. Sir, would you please hear my case? And she kept knocking on the door and knocking at the door. And finally, in a snit of exasperation, this corrupt official said, all right already, I'll hear your case. Not because he had a sudden conversion to concern for the things of God or for the justice among human beings, but because she was bugging him. And he couldn't stand it anymore. He said, all right, all right, I'll hear your case. And so he does and gives justice to the woman. Now let me tell you what this parable does not mean. The parable does not mean that just as this unjust judge finally heard this woman's case after her repeated please, so God will then, in a like manner, 
hear our pleas if we persist in making our requests known to him and if we cry loudly enough. That is not what this text is teaching. Let me tell you why it isn't. Sometimes Jesus uses similes and metaphors. Well, he will say, something is like something else, or the kingdom of God is like unto this, or the kingdom of God is like unto that. And you have a simple comparison or an analogy between two like entities. But there's a whole nother set of para parables that I call the how much more parables. And this is one of them. Jesus doesn't say, and in the terms of a mathematical equation, that just like this unjust judge heard the case of the woman, God will hear your pleas. No. What he's saying is this. If this corrupt, no good bum of a judge will finally listen to the pleas of this impoverished woman, then what do you think the just and holy judge of all of the earth who is altogether righteous, what do you think he will do with the cries of his people? If this corrupt man will hear the cries, how much more will the judge of all of the earth hear the pleas of his people? Now, there are two questions to which the parable drives our attention. And the first one is certainly rhetorical. When Jesus says, and will not God vindicate his elect who cry unto him day and night? night. I don't care if it's day and night for a week, day and night for a month, day and night for 30 years, day and night for 38 years by the pool of Bethesda. Will not God vindicate his people who cry unto him day and night? Now, a rhetorical question is a question that, when it is stated, has an answer that is perfectly clear and manifest and unmistakable. What is the answer to this question, will not God vindicate his elect who cry unto him day and night? The answer is what? Yes! I begin in the first message of this conference speaking from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. I passed over lightly the citation that he had in there when he wrote, I hath not seen, nor hath the ear heard nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. When we read the scriptures of the Old Testament and of the New, we see in there that the fall of man into sin does not affect us alone but it affects the animals. It affects the flowers. It affects the weather. There is a perturbation. There is a disturbance that intrudes into nature, into the entire universe. The entire universe is now under a curse. 
Oh, how I love the words of the Christmas carol, Joy to the uh, World, that one stands in there where it speaks of far as what? The curse is found. How far is that? That the redemption of Christ is not only for us, but it is for the created order. As the Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Romans, the whole creation groans together. The whole creation is moaning, waiting for the revelation of the children of God. That the whole creation is crying out to God that God would restore the world, that God would set the world right side up, that God would come and heal the nations, that God would remove the curse once and for all from all of the world. Sometimes we read the, the stories and hear the preachers talk about the end of the world. What I hear in the Bible is not that the world is going to end, but that the world is going to be redeemed, that the world is going to be renovated, that the world is going to be made new. As we've just heard a few moments ago from the final chapters of the New Testament, the vivid imagery, the description of a new heaven and of a new earth. It almost seems to me like every year that we have the Orlando Conference, I get the assignment at the end of the conference to teach something out of the final chapters of the book of Revelation because we always want to end where the Bible ends with the blessed hope that Scripture gives us of that great hour of redemption when the creation will once and for all stop groaning and stop crying. Now, Paul said to the Corinthians, I hath not seen, nor ear has heard, nor has it even entered in the imaginations that are the heart of man what God has prepared. But that was written before the apostle John was exiled to the island of Patmos. Those words were written before on the Lord's day God peeled back the curtain for a moment and said, look at this, John. I want to show you something. Listen, watch, and write it down as fast as you can because I want the whole church to get this preview of coming attractions. And John fell at the angel's feet as if dead. And he looked around and he saw the one who was introduced to him as Alpha and Omega, as the Son of Man. Look, John, at what's coming. And throughout the chapters of the Revelation, John gives us a faithful record of what his eyes were permitted to see. Until we come to chapter 21, and we read these words. 
And now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no more sea. Now, some Christians are extremely disappointed when they read those first words of the description of the new creation. No more sea? Do you know how much money we, sp we save every year so that when vacation time comes, we can go to the sea? We have sand in our shoes. We want to go to the sea. We want to go to the shore. We want to fish. We want to swim. We want to go boating. What good is a new heaven and a new earth if there's no more sea? The key to understanding the apocalypse, the graphic imageries that are so mysterious in this last book of the Bible, the fundamental principle of interpreting this book is that you interpret it by the key that is provided, not by the Rosetta Stone, but by the rest of Scripture. You interpret Scripture by Scripture. And if you look at the poetic images of the Old Testament, you will see that the Israelites of the Old Testament did not have the fondness for the sea that you do. They never developed a sea trade. Their coast was rocky, and the only people they knew close by them who were engaged in a seafaring industry were the Philistines, who were not their closest friends. And the other experiences that they would have would be from these violent storms that would come roaring off the Mediterranean and beat against the mountains. And if you read the imagery of the, the Sams, trying to learn how to speak the language, <laughs> or the Psalms, whichever the case may be, what do you hear? in the Psalms. The sea roars and is troubled, and the waves of the sea, the billows of the sea, beat against the sides of the mountains. The symbol in Hebrew poetry and Hebrew literature of the sea is always a symbol of chaos, of destruction, of death and of threat. The water image that is the image that is positive in Hebrew poetry is of the river or the spring or the well. There is a river, says the psalmist, the streams whereof make glad the city of God, the habitation of the Most High. It was the well, the oasis in the middle of the desert that the people responded to positively. Did anyone hear about the sea? And so when this vision of the new heaven and the new earth is seen by John, He's told there's no sea, which means what? No chaos, no destruction, nothing anymore to be afraid of. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I saw the holy city not as an urban slum, but I saw it in the most regal finery. I saw it dressed and wrapped as a bride marching down the aisle 
on her wedding day. As a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice, a voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. I'm going to tell you something very personal, very intimate, very private, at the expense of alienating my wife forever. We just celebrated our 40th anniversary last Sunday, and I told her, you know, we're like the people of, of Israel. We've been wandering around in wilderness for 40 years. It's time now to enter the promised land. <laughs> but we have traditions, little tender customs that define our marriage. And every woman knows that every man is just a bigger, older little boy. Stop me if I'm lying. <laughs> In reality, we're big babies. And there are many times that I go to bed at night before Vesta. And the custom is this. I'll say, honey, pat me. And she comes over, and she pats me on the back for just a few moments, which calms my spirit, makes me comfortable, and makes it easy for me to put my head on the pillow and go to sleep. Well, why in the world would a grown man do something like that? I just want to know that she's there. She doesn't have to say anything. I just want to feel her hand on my back to know that she's there. And she then goes over to her, her desk and starts dealing with mail or whatever. But I know that she's there. And as long as she's there, it's okay. I can go to sleep. For all is right with the world. Imagine this. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. There's even one greater than Vesta who promises to be with you and to be your God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I, I can't remember in my life shedding as many tears as I've shed in the last few weeks because of my friend. I will never forget, as long as I live, writing my final letter to Jim Boyce, knowing when I wrote it that I would never see him again in this world. I wrote it at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I had to write it 
because I had to tell him how much I loved him. And I sat in the restaurant where I write most of my sermons and messages, <laughs> the steak and shake, <laughs> on the placemats, which they're going to charge me for someday. And I wondered what the other stragglers who were in the restaurant at 4 o'clock in the morning were thinking, because I just couldn't stop weeping. as I was writing this letter to Jim and writing my farewell. And I thought yesterday morning that I was done with that, done with the tears. I've had so many of them. but I'm not. They come back. But there will be a day when God will wipe away all of our tears. And when God wipes away our tears, there will be no more tears. and there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, and no more pain, the Lord Jesus says. For the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write. Write this down, for these words are true. These words are faithful. This is Jesus speaking here now. And Jesus says, John, write it down. Because what I'm telling you is the truth it's faithful, you can take it to the bank, you can give your life to it. You can stand in the middle of the fire in Scotland and trust it. You can go to the square in China and believe it. For these pains and trials and tribulations that we endure are but for a moment, and they're not worthy to be compared with the things that God has stored up in heaven for His people. Part of my letter to my friend was this little bit of a rebuke. How dare you, Jim Boyce, leave me here like this. I'm jealous. Aren't you? And he said to me, it's done. For I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning, I am the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. And he who overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Then in verse 9, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come here. Let me show you something. Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. 
he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, showed me the great, great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Listen, ladies and gentlemen. It's not like at the end God is going to create a new city and God is going to make a new Jerusalem. There already is a new Jerusalem. It's right now in heaven. And we get a taste of it every Sabbath morning when we come together to worship the living God. What does the author of Hebrews say? We no longer come to that mountain that cannot be touched by human hands, where there is storms, where there is clouds, where there is thunder, where there is fire, where even animals were put to death if they approached it. But no, now we enter into what? The heavenly sanctuary into the presence of angels and archangels, to the presence of just men made perfect, to the presence of God and to the Lamb. That is the mystical body of Christ. That is the sweet mystic communion that we experience when we gather for worship. We get a taste of heaven. a momentary visit in the Spirit to the heavenly Jerusalem. And God says, one day I'm going to take that heavenly Jerusalem, I'm going to bring it down here. Where you're not just going to have a taste of heaven, it's going to be a feast. The feast to end all feasts. That's what I've prepared for you, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven, having the glory of God, and what a magnificent recitation we heard earlier, describing the foundation, the adornment, all those jewels that I can't even pronounce, <laughs> the pearly gates and the streets of gold. I see gold that has been rolled to such a thin veneer that it is translucent, that is glowing. That's what I see, that, 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 that the streets will blind you. Nothing like the streets of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I grew up, the pothole capital of the world. These will be streets of gold. Now, beloved, this is imaginative language. typical of this type of apocalyptic literature, that it's very dangerous to take these things literally. But I have to say, I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> I would not put it past him to see a city with literal streets of gold. and there's a stream there. The waters flow right down the middle of the city. The tree of life on both sides and the leaves for the healing of the nation. But what is conspicuously absent is there's no temple there. There is no church building there. Well, why should there be? said earlier, the Lord God would be the tabernacle. There's no sun. No sun? What would happen to this planet if the sun were blotted out? Not only would we be plunged into impenetrable darkness, but we would very shortly freeze to death. Oh, there'll be a sun in the New Jerusalem. An S-O-N, whose countenance is so refulgent, 
where the brilliance and the dazzling manifestation of the glory of God is so intense that the light that the Apostle Paul saw on the road to Damascus, which was brighter than the noonday sun, will be eclipsed by this light, the unveiled beauty of the majesty of God and of his Christ will enlighten the whole city. And that sun will never set. And they shall see his face. and his name shall be on their foreheads. Now I, John, I saw these things. I heard these things. And when I heard and when I saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things, but he said to me, Don't do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brothers, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Worship God. For will not God vindicate his people, his people who turn the world upside down, and his people who cry unto him day and night. You've heard the answer to that question. Let's pray. Father, we can't imagine. It hasn't entered into our hearts anything that could be better than this. Sustain us with this blessed hope now and forever.